right, so this week our movie for the Faith in Film class was Schindler's List, which is by far the darkest and most difficult movies on our list. Schindler's List, for those of you who are unaware, portrays in a, quite a bit of detail the Holocaust. During the Holocaust, six million Jews throughout Europe were, were killed. And of those six million, three million of them came from Poland. And the story takes place almost entirely in Krakow, Poland. The violence and the cruelty that's portrayed in Schindler's List for three long hours is extremely hard to watch. But as you watch, one character emerges as being sort of the epitome of all of the evil. His name is Amon Goth. He is based on a real-life character. And he brutally slaughters people for target practice, for not working as hard as he thought they should, and sometimes for no reason at all, no discernible reason at all. And as you watch his extreme cruelty in particular, you have to wonder, what is it that causes a person to be so evil? What is it that causes such hate and violence in the midst of one person? And somewhere in the middle of the movie, we see an answer. He is trying to seduce his housemaid, and who is Jewish, and he picked her out of the people in his work camp to come and work at his house. But he, so he is in the basement with her, and he's trying to, he's wanting to sleep with her, wanting to uh, um, seduce her, and he says. I know you are not a person, but I find myself attracted to you. And he goes on and on and on. And the thing that stood out to me was right there in that phrase, I know that you are not a person. Do you hear that? That, for me, is the key that allows evil and violence to rage in the world. When we fail to see other people groups as real people, when we fail to think that the slaves or the Jews or the Native Americans or any other group is not real, not a real person like us, then we have begun on a path that leads to a horrible evil. Now, when the topic of the Holocaust arises, it becomes very easy to uh, watch movies like this and point fingers at the Nazis and say, well, they were horribly cruel. And uh, those Nazis are not like us, and we uh, thankfully defeated them in World War II, and now it's over. And we put the movie back in its case, and we think, oh, I'm so glad that that chapter in history is done. But you see, there are several problems with these thoughts. First, it isn't over. Cruelty, brutality, other, utter disregard for human life are still happening. In London this week, for example, someone treated pedestrians on a bridge like they were just pawns in a game, just pieces to be moved around in the game of terror. There was disregard for human life, and it happens all over the world. In refugee camps, it happens within our cities. Disregard for human life is a key component in the evil that exists. The second problem with simply just dismissing the Nazis is that we are making them less than human. We have to find a way to see them as, as people as well. They're not just Nazis and bad because they wear that label. They're bad because they chose to sin, because they gave in to temptation, because they allowed hate to grow in their heart but they are people, and we can't dismiss them any more than we can dismiss the victims. But the last and the greatest problem with watching this movie and only criticizing the Nazis is that it misses a far greater evil that happened when millions of good and faithful people failed to act for justice for those in need. 
You see, far too often, the greatest injustice is our lack of response, our feeling that the problem is too big and too overwhelming to do anything about. Racism, anti-Semitism, poverty, hunger, even something as simple as bullying can seem like such a big problem that we feel utterly helpless in the face of evil. And we think, I can't do anything to stop it, so I'll just pretend that it doesn't exist. We can't possibly feed the crowd, Jesus' disciples tell him. There's just too many of them. Send them away so that we don't have to think about their needs. We don't have enough food to stop the hunger of the world. We don't have enough water to wash away the evil of the world. Jesus, there just isn't enough. But you see, they did have something. They had five loaves and they had two fish. And they had Jesus. They had Jesus, and it turns out that that is more than enough. On the day that the 5,000 were fed, the disciples had been telling Jesus about their amazing time away in pairs, going to city to city, and talking about all the good things that had happened to them, and talking about Jesus. But as they're trying to report about their trip and their experiences, people kept coming, and they kept interrupting. And so Jesus took them away to a quiet place. But others ran on foot and arrived ahead of the boat. Now, I don't know how fast that boat was moving, but it seems to me that you have to be pretty motivated to run and catch a boat, don't you think? To run ahead of the boat and get there before it stops. And so when the disciples get off the boat, here's what I think they were thinking. Now, this is me um, putting my own thoughts into it. But I think that when they got there and they saw the crowd, they saw just a crowd, a needy crowd that would prevent them from spending time with Jesus. But I think that when Jesus got off the boat, he didn't see a crowd. He saw people and had compassion on them. That's what the text tells us. He saw them and had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. I imagine that Jesus looked into that crowd and saw perhaps Joanna, who was worried about her son that was dying. Jesus saw Asher, who was desperate for rain so that his crops would grow and he so that he'd be able to feed his family. Jesus saw thousands of men and women and children who had legitimate worries and legitimate problems and fears. Jesus didn't see a crowd. He saw people. Jesus sees them and has compassion on them. And when it comes time to feed the people, he's not afraid. He knows that there will be enough, and he prays and distributes what he has with confidence. And so in the end, The feeding of the 5,000 really isn't a story about bread and fish. And maybe we shouldn't even call it the feeding of the 5,000 because I think at its core, it's not really a story about what to do when you have to feed a crowd who's really hungry. This is a story about trusting God and giving God everything you can, trusting that God will make it enough. It's a story about trust and a story about compassion. Now, to return to the movie for a moment, as much as this is a film about the Holocaust in Poland, it's also the story of a man who made a difference. And what I think is fascinating is to watch the character of Schindler progress. At the beginning of the movie, it's pretty hard to admire his character. He comes into war-torn Krakow with the sole purpose of making and spending as much money as he possibly can. He goes to lavish parties. He has multiple affairs. He drinks as much alcohol as he can get his hands on. He doesn't care about the plight of the Jews. Now, he doesn't seem to hate them either, but he doesn't really want to step out and do anything for them. But it begins to change as the war continues. Now, for those of you who are hoping to go to the class on Wednesday night, pull out your pencils. I've got an answer to one of the questions for you, all right? Um, So 
there is in this movie a little girl in a red coat and you see her two different times in the movie and it's very striking because the whole movie is in black and white except for this one girl in the red coat and what I think the reason for that red coat is that it marks a turning point in Schindler's life in his character it's when he begins to see when he begins to see not just Jews, but when he begins to see individual people. And so shortly after he sees this young girl for the first time, uh, a woman comes to him and she has forged papers that say that she's not Jewish. And she says, your factory is a safe haven and I want my parents to come and work here. And he gets angry. He sends the girl away. He says, I'm not a safe haven. I'm not running a charity. I'm running a factory. We're making money. And he goes to his accountant and he yells at his accountant and he says, what are you doing spreading rumors that this is a safe haven? We are here to make money. But then he pulls the slip of paper out of his pocket and he asks for this girl's parents to be placed as workers in his factory you see his thoughts begin to change. And, and he begins to bring in more and more workers that he claims are very skilled, but are children or people who clearly couldn't work very well for him. But he brings them in, making his factory very much a safe haven. And then after the girl appears again the second time, he, his transformation is complete. He decides to make his famous list and move all of his workers to a safer place in Czechoslovakia near his hometown. And he sets up a new factory there and brings all of the people there in order to save them. And so in one of the final scenes in the movie, the war has just ended and Schindler knows that he has to flee because he's still officially a member of the Nazi party. And so he's getting ready to go and there's this very famous scene. He's standing in front of his car getting ready to leave and he has this utter breakdown and he says, with this car I could have saved 10 more people and with this pin I could have saved two more people and with my uh, various accessories I could have saved more. And he longs that for the ability to give up absolutely everything to help these people that he's grown to love. In this scene, he no longer sees the people as Jews, but sees them as people, and he's able to list them by name. Now, for us going forward this week, the Holocaust, as we've said, is over, and that is such a good thing. Um, it's good that we are no longer struggling with that. But we still have challenges for ourselves. And so I will boil them down to just two points. One, we are called to see people as Jesus saw them. We cannot afford to see people as the blanks. And you can fill in that blank however you wish. The Jews or the blacks or the young kids or the old people or the people from that political party or the whatever, every time that we use a label and assume that that label encompasses all of who someone is, we've failed to see people as Jesus did. We need to see people and have compassion for them. Now, this is not easy, and it's tempting to be overwhelmed and to think, I don't have enough. I don't have enough love to give. I don't have enough money to give. I don't have enough resources to give. But this story in Mark reminds us that even in the face of overwhelming problems, we are called to trust that when we give what we have to Jesus, he will make it enough. God, there's an old saying, and I'll say it again, um, God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Five loaves and two fish were certainly not enough to feed 5,000 people. Saving 1,200 people, as Schindler's, Schindler did, really wasn't enough in a lot of ways. He wanted to be able to save more, and we wish he had. Our resources are paltry compared to the problems that exist. But you see, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. He can take all of our offerings and bless them and share them with the world 
so that they will be more than enough. We, on our own power, don't have enough to stop evil in its tracks, but Jesus does. So let us live and let us love and let us give like Jesus, remembering that when we feel like we don't have enough, Jesus has more than enough for all of us. Amen.